Hey, what's happening, Transformation Church? This is Pastor Derwin Gray. And to our guests at our campuses, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are kicking off a six-week series entitled The Gospel And. Uh, Throughout this series, you are going to encounter some phenomenal communicators, people who are committed to Jesus, committed to his gospel. And to kick off our series, The Gospel And, a friend, uh, a mentor, uh, a hero of mine, as well as my wife, Kay Warren is going to come and teach us. She's going to come share her heart with us. She's going to teach the gospel and mental health. So let's give my friend, our friend, Kay Warren, a huge Transformation Church welcome. Good morning. It is an amazing privilege to be with Transformation Church this weekend. When Pastor Derwin invited me a few months ago, I jumped at the chance to come be with you because um, I love Pastor Derwin and Vicki, and I love the reputation you all are building around the kingdom for loving people the way Jesus does, for really being engaged with the vital issues of what's going on in our world and our culture, for for modeling the way heaven's going to look. And you're just an amazing place, and I just couldn't wait to be here. So thank you so much for this privilege. Um, As Pastor Derwin mentioned, I also get the privilege of kicking off this new sermon series on the gospel, the good news, and um, mental illness. And, you know, it's a really logical question to just kind of right out the gate go, well, does the Bible really say much about mental illness? And, And I think the answer is yes. Um, very resoundly. In Luke 4, verses 17 to 21, Jesus has just, give you a little background, he's just finished this 40-day time of being, of, of testing in the wilderness where Satan has, has offered every temptation he can think of, and Jesus is exhausted, he's weary, but he comes back to Nazareth, the place that he grew up, and he goes to the synagogue. It's, it was his custom, the Bible says, to go, and, and when he's there, they hand him the scroll of Isaiah. That was that day's reading, and we think of with our Bibles, you know, we flip through the pages, but they would kind of scroll through a scroll. So Jesus takes this scroll of Isaiah, and he unrolls rolls it to these verses, and this is what he read that day. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So Jesus reads this. The Bible says he sat down, and then he looked at them and said, Today, this passage has been fulfilled in your presence. So Jesus was saying, the Messiah is coming, and Isaiah says that this is what the Messiah is going to do, and you guys, I'm the Messiah, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand with those who suffer. I'm going to bind up the brokenhearted. I'm going to free the captives. I'm going to release the prisoners. He said, I'm going to stand with those who suffer. And if you and I, as as Followers of Jesus Christ are going to be like him, our Messiah. We're going to need to stand with people who suffer. And some of the people who suffer the greatest in our society, in our world, are people living with mental illness. You know, there's an awful lot about mental illness we don't know. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer 11 years ago, I I had an ultrasound, and I had a mammogram, and I had an MRI. There were tests that they could take that would accurately figure out what was wrong with me and what was going on in my body. But when it comes to mental illness, there isn't just a blood test. There's not a scan that you can take. There's not an ultrasound that definitively defines what it is you might be struggling with. And so mental illness, there's, there's a lot about it that we don't know. But there are some things that we absolutely do know, and those are a couple things I want to share with you as we get started. The first thing that we absolutely know about mental illness is that one in five adults in the United States will experience some type of mental illness in the next year. That's like 60 million Americans if you do the math. So that means that far from being a rare occurrence, mental illness is happening to people that we love, to ourselves, to our neighbors, 60 million Americans are going to struggle with a mental illness in the next year. We know that one in five children will also experience a mental illness in the next year. We know that the prison system has really become the main provider of mental health care in our country. It's an unfortunate situation. It's worthy of a whole conversation in and of itself. But the mental health system in the United States has deteriorated to rather than it being handled through the mental health system, it's handled so much through the 
legal system, through law, through prisons and jails. In LA County, uh, where I live, the number one um, provider of mental health services is the LA County Jail. And that's true of almost every place you go in the United States. And like I said, that's worthy of an entire conversation in and of itself. Another thing that we absolutely know is that in 2013, 41,000 people in America took their lives. That's twice as many murders. So there are twice as many suicides in our country as there are murders. And on April 5th, 2013, our beautiful, hilariously funny, enormously creative, seriously mentally son, Matthew, took his life. He became one of those statistics. And in the two years since he has died, we have been absolutely devastated and crushed by his death. His suicide launched us into what I call catastrophic grief and loss. I will never be the same as I was on April 4th that I was after April 5th. And uh, Rick and I both have lost parents. He's lost a sibling. We've lost people close to us, very dear to us that we miss and that we loved and grieved when they passed away. But I can tell you that nothing touched the death of our son. Uh, my worst nightmare has already happened. My worst, the worst day of my life has already happened. And um, I will miss our boy every day of my life until I see him again in heaven. And I could talk for hours about the effect of his death on our family, his friends, our church, even strangers. I could fill pages of notes for you with statistics about mental illness. But really what I want to do in these, these brief moments that we have together is to try to explain to you why I, feel like, why I feel like that it's the church that has to step up to the plate in this crisis that we're experiencing in our country with people living with mental illness. The church has a unique opportunity to do something that nobody else can do. The government is trying, med medical professionals are trying, there's organizations that are trying, there's social services. There are a lot of people engaged in mental health care in the United States. And they're all good and they're all necessary. But let me tell you where I think is missing. What's missing is the church of Jesus Christ. And the church plays a unique role. We occupy a space in this conversation that really only belongs to the church. And when we understand that, we can step up in ways and care for people in ways that nobody else can do. It's, it's, a, it's a mistake that we've made along the road to abandon people to the government, to abandon people to the medical profession. It's, it's a terrible mistake that we in the church have made of, of ignorance and denial and, um, and putting our heads in the sand and saying, well, we'll let, we'll let the professionals deal with that. There's really nothing we can do. And I want to hopefully make an argument for something very different from that. I'm going to give you some practical, six practical steps in a few minutes of what I think Transformation Church can do for people in your congregation and people living in this community for mental illness. But first of all, I want to just talk to you a little bit more about the church. I want to tell you a story about the church. A few years ago, I visited Mother Teresa's home for the dying in Calcutta, India. At the time, I was an advocate for people living with HIV and AIDS and for orphans, and, and I wanted to see this incredible work that Mother Teresa and her missionaries of charity did in Calcutta and in many other big cities in, around, around the world. They will collect the, the people who are dying that are abandoned, that are on, on street corners or on the gutter, that are, that are completely abandoned and near death. And rather than let them die alone in the gutter, they will bring them to her homes and um, their, their public homes and then care for them. So I visited um, Mother Teresa's and I volunteered for a day. And um, as soon as I got there, I saw that the men, you know, there were 50 men being cared for on one side of the building and 50 women being cared for on the other side of the building. And all of us who were volunteering that day were instructed that we were supposed to put on gloves and we were supposed to put on masks because the people that we were caring for had a whole variety of illnesses, most of them contagious, like tuberculosis. And um, so as I got there, and it was my turn to dig out some gloves and masks out of a box, the masks that were left were gigantic. I mean, I could have wrapped them around my head and used them as a turban. They were not effective. They wouldn't even stay on my face. So I just kind of discarded the mask. The gloves didn't fit right. And so I entered this space of caring for these dying women with no gloves, no mask, nothing. And uh, they put us to work. Our job was, as volunteers was to give these dying women showers. And so I and a couple other volunteers carried very frail, dying women 
um, naked in front of a cold water spout. There was no hot water. And so I'm watching these tiny little shriveled bodies of women who are near death being bathed, um, put in a clean gown. We had to change the sheets on the bed, and many of them were covered with you know, feces and diarrhea, and, and I mean, it was, it was very disgusting, and within a few minutes, I was thinking, what have I done? I don't belong here. I don't know anything about this. this is making me ill, the sights, the sounds, the smells, and so I kind of retreated to a corner of this room where they were caring for the, for the dying women, and I, they gave me the job of folding newspapers into makeshift paper bags so that you could put a soiled dressing in. So I'm sitting in the corner folding my paper bags, hoping that my time as a volunteer is going to go quickly and I don't have to talk to or touch anybody else. And as I was sitting there and thinking about what a total failure I was, um, I, I kind of lifted my eyes and I made eye contact with a woman, a dying woman across the room sitting on a bed. And she started motioning to me and I'm like, oh, no, shoot, shoot, I didn't see that. So I put my head down and I'm trying to keep folding my bandages and I kind of lifted my eyes again and she's going, I'm like, ooh, you know. And so then I was like, what am I gonna do? I gotta do it. So I got up, I walked over to where this woman is on a bed and the minute I sit down on her bed, she begins crying, just copiously weeping and speaking to me in Bengali. Well, I don't speak Bengali. I had no idea what she was saying, but I felt as though God gave me an interpretation for what she was saying. And I felt like what she was saying to me as she was sobbing, how did I end up here? How did I end up dying on the street? How did I end up in one of Mother Teresa's homes? Where is my family? My life has been so hard. Why did they leave me? I'm gonna die here alone. I'm in pain. I can't stand it. Help me do something. And all I knew to do, because we had no language that was similar, is I put my arms around her and I drew her close and I began to speak and I was praying, God, please interpret in some way what I'm saying so that she understands. And I said, as my arms were around her, I'm so sorry that this is where you are today. I am so sorry that you are ill and that your family has left you and maybe they couldn't care for you or they, I don't know, but you're here and I, my, I, my heart breaks, I'm so sorry. And I want you to know that you are not alone, that God has sent me today and that my arms around you, holding you close, are the arms of Jesus telling you that you matter to him. And, and my hands, as I wipe the tears from your face, these fingers are the fingers of Jesus, and they love you. He's telling you how valuable you are to him, and that even though this life has been so difficult, there is a home in heaven for you, and you are loved, and I am not going to let you die alone. And you say, wait, you were, said you were going to tell us a story about the church. I didn't hear you say anything about the church. That's my point. What Sister, what Mother Teresa and her missionaries of charity did and what they do on a daily basis is amazing. It's phenomenal. And I love the fact that they were willing to go out and find the people, truly the throwaway people, dying on street corners and in gutters and that nobody else wants and nobody else is. I'm so glad that they're doing that. But it is an indictment against the local believers in Calcutta and in every other city. Where was the local church? Where were the local Christians who would come and say, I will take you off that street corner. You don't have to go to an organization. You will come into our church. You will come into my home. I'm not going to let you die alone. Our church is a representative of Jesus Christ in this city, and we will care for you. And so I have to extract, I have to go from there. Where is it in our community, in my community, that we have abandoned people to others and said, let them take care of them? I don't have a professional medical degree. I'm not a mental health expert. I'm just an average person. How could I possibly care for somebody dying on the street corner? How could I possibly make a difference in the life of somebody who's been abandoned by their family? And so we say to ourselves and we comfort ourselves and think, I don't know how to do that. We'll let somebody else who knows what they're doing do that. And in the process, the church is removed from the very place we're supposed to be, which is in the heart of people's need and in their brokenness and in their dying and in their hurting. In Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, from the message paraphrase, it says this. It's talking about Christ and his resurrection. It says, all this energy issues from Christ. 
God raised him from the dead and set him on a throne in deep heaven in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule, and not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything, and at the center of all of this, Christ rules the church. And listen to this, the church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. What that is saying, it's that far from the church being over here in our little corner looking at the rest of the world saying, okay, you guys take care of all that stuff out there because we're going to just love Jesus and each other right here and we're going to be over here and we're on the edge, on the periphery of the world. This scripture says, no, the exact opposite is true. The church is in the center of it all and the world is peripheral to us, meaning that it is on the edges and on the margins and we are supposed to be there in the center taking care of what's happening. Far from being removed, we're to be right in the middle. Now, I don't know if we could sit down and have a cup of coffee together, a cup of tea, and you might be honest enough to say to me, you know, I'm at church, I'm a part of this church, or I'm a part of another church, or I'm here seeking, I'm, I'm trying to figure all this out, but I'm not really sure that the church has much to do with this. I'm really not sure that this is a rule from the church, because you know what? The church has messed up a lot of things that it should have been good at. There are a lot of things that the church was supposed to have done well that it hasn't done well, so I don't know how in the world we could trust that the church is going to be part of this solution. But you guys, God says it's the church, that the church is at the center. God has put all of his eggs in the church basket. He doesn't have any other basket. If we as a church don't get it done in the world, it will not get done. God is not looking to the government to do this. He's not looking to social services to do that. He's not looking to the medical community. He's looking to his body, the church, who's at the center where Christ rules. And he says, you from that place, you are to be in the world, and all of my eggs are in this church basket. We don't like to think of it that way because that puts so much more responsibility on us. It means we have to care about things we haven't been caring about. It means that we have to get involved in things we haven't gotten involved in. It means we have to do things that we thought that the professionals or the experts should be a part of when God is saying, uh-uh, no, 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 you. It's you. It's you, my church. And in his church, you guys, there is a place for everybody, for everyone in this church that he has made. There is a place for the posers and the pretenders. In his church, there's a place for the powerful and the powerless. There's a place for the brainiacs and a place for the idiots. There's a place for the popular and the unpopular. A place for the sick and the healthy. There's a place for the sinful and the righteous. There's a place for the geeks and the freaks and the dorks. There's a place for the jocks and the athletically challenged like me. There's a place for the broken and the whole. There's a place for the winners and the losers. In Christ church, there's a place for the strong and the weak. There's a place for those who never seem to fail, those annoying people who always are at the top. And there's a place for those of us who rarely get it right. There's a place for the druggers, the drugs, I'll get it here in a second, the drunks, the druggies, the addicts, the abusers, the abused. There's a place for the dealers, the murderers, the rapists, the thieves. There's a place for the beautiful, the ugly, and all the average people in between. There's a place for the physically disabled. There's a place for the mentally ill. There's a place for every race, every language, every ethnic group, every gender. There is a place for those who don't fit neatly into any category. All have a place in his church. So if that's true, and I believe that the Bible clearly tells us that that's true, then there's a place for Transformation Church to make a difference in the lives of those with mental illness. So this is that little acrostic that I want to give to you. It's based on the word church because I do believe it is the church that is being called to this. And so if you're taking notes and you want to write down what are these practical steps that I think every church, including yours, can do. And the first thing is to care for and support people who are ill. Care for and support people who are ill, those individuals and families. Luke 6:36 Jesus says, "You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate." 
You don't have to have thousands upon thousands of people attending this church every week before you can be a caring and compassionate church. You don't have to bring in millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars before you can have a program and an outreach in this church for people who are mentally ill. What it requires is not huge attendance or gigantic amounts of money. In fact, everything that I'm going to tell you right now, these six things, don't cost a penny. So they don't, you have no excuse for how much money you think it's going to cost. And it doesn't require a super amount of training. So we're not talking about people who have to be experts. This is what you, average person, average member of Transformation Church can do. Care for and support those who are sick. See, what it requires, rather than money or high attendance, is a decision. It's a decision that says, I am going to be as compassionate toward others as God has been to me. Because when it has all been said and done, at the end of your life, when somebody takes stock of who you are and what you've been and what you've done, the benchmark for your life, if the benchmark that you measure yourself against is not the ability and the depth to which you can give and receive compassion, then you've missed the mark. We spend most of our lives with a completely different set of standards and a benchmark. We, like everybody outside of the church, get caught in the same traps, measuring ourselves by how much money we have, how well our finances are doing, how strong we are physically, how good is our marriage, whether we're married, what career we've gotten, where we live in town, what kind of a car we drive, what sort of accolades or awards or recognition are we getting, how much meaning we have in what it is we do in our jobs. Those are all the wrong benchmarks. Those are all externals that really have nothing to do with God's transformative work inside me and you. The benchmark for our lives, my friends, is the depth to which we can give and receive compassion. And when that becomes the standard for your life, you have something to measure against that is concrete and something that is real and something that is based right out of the Word of God and is modeled after the life of Jesus Christ. Again, I said if we could sit and have a cup of coffee, if we could sit and talk to each other without, you know, unhurried time and just chat and get acquainted, I think that I would find in the depths of who you are as in the depths of who I am, in the depths of every person I've ever met or ever hoped to meet, there's something that is similar about us, and it is this. At the core of who we are, we crave. I mean crave to be loved, to be noticed, to be cared for, to have somebody acknowledge that we exist on this planet and that somebody has paid attention to us. There are people in this room, people watching online, people who've already been here today, people who will be here next week, people in your family, people on your row, people that you're going to say goodbye to as you leave here, people that you're going to meet the minute you walk out of here, and they are aching. It's almost a physical ache to be loved, to be noticed, cared for, and valued. Loneliness is probably the greatest epidemic in our world. We are so connected externally and so unconnected at the level that really counts. Psalm 6920 says, the psalmist who wrote this said, I'm, I'm broken by their taunts. I'm flat on my face. I'm reduced to a nothing. I looked in vain for one friendly face, not one. I couldn't find one shoulder to cry on. See, what's happened to us is that we have adopted the Americanized, westernized version of friendship. And in that version of friendship, which is about that deep, it's based on this, hey, I like you. You're really likable. I'm really likable. We could be friends. Or you enjoy that? I enjoy that. You like that? I like that. We can be really good friends. If it's connected in sports, it's connected around a hobby, if it's connecting about your interest in work, if it's connected about academics, it doesn't really matter. But we find something that we have in common with somebody else and we go, you are like me, therefore I would like to be friends with you. And we put all of our efforts and our energies into building those kinds of friendships. And the problem is, as I said, they're about this deep, and they have nothing to do with the way that the Bible talks about friendship. 
In John 15, when Jesus had the opportunity to define for his disciples the way that he thought about them, he said, you guys, you are, you're, not my, you're no longer my servants. I call you friend. I call you friend. Do you understand that when God saw you and when he saw me, when he began to pursue us, you and I were heading in this direction and God was heading in this direction. So there was no similarities. It's not like we had anything in common. It wasn't like I was even very likable because by God's standard of holiness and righteousness and perfection, I'm kind of like dirt over here. I, there's nothing in me that would make him go, oh, I like you. I would like to be friends with you. So God's definition of friend was to find me at my dirtiest, my most broken, my most worthless, my most opposite of him, and say, I am going to friend you, Kay. I am going to friend you with the kind of friendship that your soul longs and craves. And he goes on to say, as I read in Luke 6, 36, you must be compassionate as your father is compassionate. So this standard of what I'm talking about, of caring for people who are living with mental illness, is so much deeper than what we would typically identify as, oh, yeah, I'll be friends with somebody. No, 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 no. We're talking about soul level that has nothing to do with what you have in common, how likable you are, or anything that would make you a good friend candidate. The other thing that we've done as we think about mental illness is we think of it as a medical issue, which it is, and that's one of the benefits of how they're finding that so much mental illness, probably they'll end up finding all of it, has some biological underpinnings that it's caused because of some things that have gone wrong in the chemistry or the, the biology in the brain. And the good thing about that is it, it takes down some of the stigma because you can go, great, it's not because I'm a lousy human being that I'm struggling with depression or anxiety, it's, it's because there's something going haywire in the wiring or the chemistry in my brain. That's great. The downside of that is it's left us again with this model of rather than friendship, with this thinking of, oh, it's a medical condition and we'll let the doctors and the psychiatrists and the psychologists and the social workers and the case managers and the nurses, they will deal with the people who are mentally ill. But that has nothing to do with me. Instead of understanding that, first of all, almost everybody around you struggles with mental illness and it is something for us to be a part of, not just the medical community. We are disciples of Jesus Christ, and we are made into his likeness, and we have been called to love at the same level that he loves, friending each other at that same place. So that's the C. It's, it's making a decision. And I, I pray, sincerely, I pray for you. You are already known for your compassion. But yet you will listen to this, and you will do some exploratory work with God, maybe today or this week, in which you will say, God, would you please show me where I have built some walls around my heart because I'm busy, because I've got enough going on in my own family. You know how hard it is for me, God. I'm, I'm struggling to make ends meet. I've got some health issues. I don't know what's going on with my kids. My marriage is in some bad places. I've got to spend all these hours at work because this is just really a season where I've got to do it. And God, I just, I can't think about this. And I'm praying that you will do some work with God this week in which you say, break down those hard places in me, God, so that I can make a decision to be a friend to people in our church. Then the H stands for in this acrostic, and I won't take as long on the rest of them where you're not going to be here all day, is the H stands for help with practical needs. Because we have to make this theoretical idea of loving practical. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer 11 years ago, um, people came out of the walls to help me. They brought our family meals. They took me to chemotherapy when I was too ill to drive. They went to doctor's appointments. They took care of my kids. I mean, I was surrounded by support when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. But I sincerely doubt that if any of you could stand up here today, if you were brave enough and felt safe enough, that you could stand up here today and say, I was diagnosed this week with depression or anxiety or bipolar or borderline personality disorder or suicidal ideation or, or OCD or schizophrenia. I doubt that if any of you felt brave enough to stand and say that, that there would be very many people who would then walk up to you and say, hey, can I, can I bring you dinner this week? Can, can, I, can I go with you? to your doctor visit, it's like all of that is gone. 
And so we suffer in silence, we suffer without the practical help of everyday people that we would normally get in other circumstances. This is something you can do. It doesn't cost money. It just takes a decision of your will to show up in the lives of people as they begin to live with a mental illness and do those practical things for them. 1 John 3, 17 says, If we see others in need and yet close our hearts against them, how can we claim that we know God? How can we claim that we know God if we're going to close our hearts against people who need help? The U in this acrostic stands for Unleash Volunteers. See, in the programs out in the community around mental illness and mental health, they are desperately seeking for volunteers. Their programs won't run without volunteers. The government can never find enough volunteers. They've got to pay people to do things. Most professional organizations have to hire people to do things. But this is the church. The church is filled with ministers. You have been given the calling of ministry as, by virtue of your relationship to Jesus Christ, by being part of his body. You are the volunteers already here intended by God to be serving. That's your job. It's your job description is to be serving. So every church has volunteers who just need to be mobilized, who can be a part of a mental health ministry. And then the R stands for remove the stigma. If the two things in this acrostic that to me are the linchpin, they are the, they are the gotta have these, and these are game changers. The first one is making a commitment to, to love people as radically in friendship as we have been loved. The second is to remove the stigma around mental illness. You guys, I've been here. This is my third service today. And in this time, I've already spoken with people who have whispered in my ear, I struggle with depression. I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with bipolar. I've been diagnosed with anxiety. I've been diagnosed with OCD. I'm already hearing it. These are your brothers and sisters who don't feel safe enough yet to tell you that they are living with mental illness and they're carrying that burden by themselves and they come here week after week after week and they look at you and they may be able to smile. They may be able to say, yeah, I'm doing great, doing good. Yeah, you know, got a few challenges, but, but, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. And inside, they're saying, oh, how I wish I could tell you how hard it was to even show up here this morning. If I could only tell you how difficult this week has been, if I could only tell you about the agony that I'm experiencing or my loved one is experiencing, if I could just share with you how much this hurts to not know who my friends are, who would stop loving me if they knew this, who would stop being my friend, who would pull away from me, who would say, you can't be in ministry, who would say, we're not trusting you around here, you've got a mental illness. If everybody knew and they so want to share themselves, you know this, some of you know this because this is your story. And as I'm saying it, the longing in your heart to be able to say, I live with I live with, and you fill in the blanks. You guys, I live with depression. I live with low levels of depression. I don't remember a day in my life that I have not struggled with depression since I was a little girl. It's been a constant companion of mine. And to be able to say that and, and live my life with that knowledge out there, it gives such freedom. So removing the stigma is a powerful thing that you and I can do to make a difference, a practical difference. Does it cost any money to remove stigma? Does it, seriously, is it gonna cost you a penny in any way to remove the stigma here? The answer is no. This is not a trick question. You're supposed to say, no. <laughs> it does not cost anything except the decision that we're gonna start living really honest and authentic lives, bringing our whole selves to the safest place on earth, which is the church. It may not be the safest place yet, but that's where it's going. That's what we're trying to create at Saddleback, and I know that's what you're trying to create here. Unfortunately, in most churches, people with mental, mental illness, when it's own, are kind of pushed away. There's just this little, little hand distance between us and other people. In Ezekiel 34, 
God's talking to the shepherds of Israel, the people that are in charge of, of, the, of the flock of God. And he says, you have not taken care of them. You've pushed the weak sheep away. So instead of them having their wounds bound up, instead of them being cared for, instead of oil being poured on their open wounds, instead of there being anything, you've pushed the weak sheep away. And God says, but I will bring them close. I will take care of them. I am the God who loves them. I will heal their wounds. I will bind up the wounded. I will take care of those who are in pain. We are his church. We are his body. And rather than pushing them away, we need to bring close, as close as we can. You guys, there's a, a young man in our church uh, who's been, he's pretty seriously mentally ill. He's been in our church for a couple years. He came in after my son died. He came because, of, actually because my son died. He heard and he thought, okay, they're talking about mental illness there. Maybe that's a place for me. And he came to Saddleback. And in these two years, we have tried to help him as a staff. We, I mean, we've paid for his, a lot of his counseling visits. The staff has spent countless hours with him, talking to him, um, listening to him. He has volunteered at church and, and been a part of things. But I got an email yesterday morning and he said, I'm leaving. He said, you've all tried to help me a lot, and I need a lot of help. He said, but after all this time, I still don't have a friend. On 4th of July, which was just a couple, you know, last week, I saw him at church, and I gave him a hug and talked to him for a few minutes, but I hurried off to my family's Fourth of July celebration. I was in a hurry. I needed to get to where I was going. And as I was walking away and almost getting in my car, I just heard just a noise behind me, and I just kind of looked over my shoulder. And as I did, I saw him standing there completely alone, no one around him. And the thought went through my head, I wonder who's going to invite him to Fourth of July. Is there anybody that's going to say, hey, come sit on the blanket on the wet grass and eat a melting ice cream cone with us as we watch the colors and share laughs and jokes and hugs. And, and I got in my car and I drove away. And yesterday when I got that email, I thought to myself, I'm so sorry, God. I am so sorry that somebody can come to our church for two years and actually receive help that was good was helpful. But at the end of the day, he still feels alone. That the stigma of his mental illness has kept people, including me, from friending him in the way that you have friended me. You can do so much for the people here in Transformation Church and the people in your community if you will decide that you're going to be about knocking down the stigma. When you understand that people with mental illness are not the people necessarily who are talking to the fire hydrants, you know, the homeless people talking to the fire hydrants and the park benches. It's not the catatonic people in corners sitting in silence. It's not the person with a gun doing some horrible thing to other people, wounding, killing, ripping up. Those are the rare people with mental illness. Most people with mental illness are just us. They're just us. It's not us and them, it's, it's we. I've got depression. Am I different now that you know that about me? Am I less valuable? Am I less trustworthy? Am I less wanting to be with? No, we're just people and we're broken. Remove the stigma. The last two quickly, the C, second C, is to collaborate with the community. This is a fabulous place for the church to collaborate because there are existing programs. There is existing help already in the community. In fact, tonight, I urge you all to come back and hear the, some practical things that the community already has going that Transformation Church can, can be a part of and to have a volunteer who would say, you know what, I'm gonna make a list of everything that's already going in our county so that when somebody comes to our church and they says, and say, I'm in a crisis and I don't know what to do, somebody here is gonna go, all right, you know what, I know exactly where to send you. There's a place in the county that takes care for substance abuse. There's a place that's got housing for somebody, that, and, and you know what those resources are, and you've learned them, and you're collaborating with the community. And the H 
in the church, in this acrostic, is to offer hope. Because nobody can offer hope like the church of Jesus Christ. Ain't nobody got hope like Jesus. Ain't nobody like the church. The government cannot offer much hope. Professionals can offer some hope, maybe with medication and therapy. There are some things, but the hope that gets you through your darkest days, the hope that says, even if I live with a mental illness the rest of my life, even if God never heals me, even if, like me, you suffer the most devastating loss that you can imagine because of mental illness, that I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to walk away. If you're living with mental illness and some of you are hanging on by a thread, a very thin little thread, you of all people need to know that there is hope for this life, but hope for eternity. Like that woman in Calcutta, she needed hope for that day, but she also needed to know that there was hope beyond that. This life, even though it stunk, there was hope in heaven for her. You and I need to be those purveyors of hope. It says in Hosea 2.15, I will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Listen, so many here and outside these walls are in their own valley of trouble. And to offer the hope of Jesus Christ, and it's the kind of hope, it's not just the hope that you come and sit in this place and maybe people are nice to you, but the hope that you will be friended, that you will be cared, you will be noticed, you will be loved, you will be noticed and somebody will tell you you're valuable and in that process you become human again and you feel like a part of the human race and you feel like a part of this world that's the hope that we want to offer to people this is my closing word to you to whom much is given much is required you have been given so much here at transformation church you have fabulous leadership a vision leaders with vision and integrity and passion You have this building that's stunning. You have gifts. You have giftings, each of you have. There's financial resources. You have been given so much. And much is required of you as a result. And I pray that out of the abundance of what God has already given to you, you may not like this, but I'm praying that God will bring an abundance of mentally ill people here who will not find it anywhere else but they're gonna find here the embrace, the love, the removal of stigma, the practical help, the hope that they need. Mother Teresa, when she formed the Missionaries of Charity, this is the last thing I'll say. What she says to those sisters who serve with her and the volunteers, why do they do what they do? Why do they go and rescue the throwaway people off of the gutters and out of the, 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 the places where they're dying alone? Why do they go find those abandoned, throwaway people and bring them in and provide a safe, warm place for them to die? Why do they do that? They say it's because they see Jesus in his most disguise, distressing disguise of the poor. In other words, every time they pick up a dying person, they see Jesus. He's hidden. They see Jesus. And so by offering love and compassion and warmth and medication and tenderness and food, they are loving Jesus. And so when you and I see Jesus in his distressing disguise of mental illness, when we look at another person who says, hey, I'm living with bipolar, I'm living with anxiety, I'm living with schizophrenia, I'm living with OCD. And instead of taking that step backwards, when we realize that Jesus is in our brother and our sister, and that by loving and embracing them, by friending them, we are loving and embracing and friending our Savior. We'll do it. We'll do it. I pray that you will grow in loving well in this community, and each other. I pray that you will love each other to the extent that you have been loved by God. May I pray for you. Father, these brothers and sisters are so precious to me and to you, and I thank you for the way that you are already using them in this community to change lives, that the testimony of each person on each row of chairs is, I have been changed because I met Jesus Christ. This church showed me that God loved me. God, thank you for what has already transpired here. Now, would you bring more and more hurting people? Would you bring them to this place not to overwhelm the staff, 
but so that each member of the congregation will step up and say, I will be a friend. I will walk alongside. I'm living with mental illness. I love somebody who's mentally ill. I care about people. God, make this place a place where the friendship of God is known and worked out on a practical, daily basis through love. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hey, what's happening? This is Pastor Derwin Gray of Transformation Church. And on behalf of the Transformation Church family, I want to thank you for tuning in to our podcast. Um, right now, I am in our brand new Transformation Church 521 uh, state-of-the-art facility. And uh, gosh, we're so happy. We got our own like real building now so that more people can be uh, encouraged in the gospel, transformed in the gospel, so that people who don't know Christ can come to know Him. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for, for tuning in. Like, we really, really believe that Jesus is resurrected. We believe that his gospel is life transformative, that he can bring a piece of heaven to earth through our lives as his church. Now, I don't want this podcast in any way to replace your participation in a local congregation. That is so important. But if we can supplement, if we can encourage you in the gospel, we want to do that because we're on the same team with the same dream. So, hey, let us know um, how the ministry of Transformation Church is impacting your life. Send us an email and let us know what Jesus is doing in your life through the ministry of Transformation Church and this awesome podcast, all right? Hey, this is Pastor Derwin Gray of Transformation Church. Peace. I'm out.